So what about risk factors? Well, one of the things that came up was extremes of age um, does dictate a, a, one of the risk factors um, for our patients. So dogs, their age, regardless of their health status. So even if you have an elderly dog that it is healthy, is assigned an ASA 1 or 2, the fact that it is older is going to increase the risk. And this is very good data. Um, it makes us know that older animals or older dogs are at risk. So dogs over the age of 12 are 9.8 times more likely to die under anesthesia than a dog between 6 months and 5 years of age. Now, all of you are probably thinking, well, in dogs, you know, a 12-year-old dog, um, you know, a chihuahua who's age 6 is not very old, but a St. Bernard who's age 6 is quite an old dog. So it's a little bit harder to interpret some of this data. But regardless of their health status, age, unfortunately, does make them um, a higher risk um, animal. When it comes to cats, again, regardless of their health status, age is a factor. So older cats are at higher risk, not as high as the older dogs were, but certainly cats over the age of 12, three and a half times more likely to die than cats aged between one and five years of age. So what is it about senior dogs and cats or older dogs and cats? Well, certainly as we age and as animals age, there's a decrease in reserve capacity in both the lungs and cardiovascular system. So they just can't withstand the same insults that the young, robust animals can. The other thing is probably a decrease in metabolism. So we may be actually giving relative anesthetic overdoses to them. And as we age, some of us know this, our, um, our, our gray matter decreases, so we don't need as much anesthetic. Um, and we're not altering our protocols um, to, to account for that. The other thing is there's no doubt that older animals have a much harder time um, thermoregulating. And as we talk, um, hypothermia, I think, is a, a common um, contributor to anesthetic death. And then, of course, older animals more likely to have subclinical disease that we just didn't pick up on. But what I think is very interesting here is what's different about dogs and cats? Well, we all know cats have to be different, and unfortunately, they want to be different as far as how difficult they are to anesthetize. So when you look at this overall, cats are twice as likely to die compared to a dog, and when they're healthy or, or put in a healthy category, again, twice as likely to die. When they're assigned to the sick status, it's about the same. So we do equally well, if you think 1.3% mortality is good, um, for sick dogs and cats. But there's something different about healthy cats and overall mortality. So what is it that makes cats more likely to die? Well, it could be size. It could be they're much more difficult to work with. And I have some theories. So are cats truly at a greater risk of dying? Or are we misclassifying them? Are they actually sicker than we think? Is it because we probably know that our preoperative assessment in cats is sometimes less thorough than in dogs because they're very difficult sometimes to, to deal with? Or is it that cats have a lot more subclinical disease than we really um, you know, think about? So what they um, found, or what, we, what I'm beginning to think is, the more and more we work with cats and learn about cat cardiac disease. I think this is probably one of the reasons that we lose cats under anesthesia. So these are just three papers that I pulled out that make me wonder every day when I nest as a cat. You know, they looked at assessment of the prevalence of heart murmurs in healthy cats, aged between one year and six years of age. Prevalence of cardiomyopathy in apparently healthy cats. Again, some of them were quite young. And then this paper that came out looking at um, echocardiography in cats that you can detect a murmur. And so basically, it turns out that you can have a completely apparently healthy cat that doesn't have a murmur, but 15% of the time, it's going to have cardiomyopathy. How are we going to know that? And so I think what we're, what's happening is that we are anesthetizing what we think are healthy cats, but actually they have severe underlying cardiac disease. And unless we echo every cat, and we're not going to be able to do that, we might not know that we're dealing with one of these cats. Now, the other thing, putting that, putting the pieces of the puzzle together, out of the SEPSAF study, IV fluid therapy was a risk factor. Giving fluids to cats increased the risk of anesthetic death. And that was both in healthy and in sick cats. So is that that we were inaccurately delivering fluids to these cats? We weren't accurately weighing them. We were accidentally overloading them. Or we were giving fluids 
to animals with subclinical heart disease. So I think that a lot of the pieces of the puzzle start to make sense. So certainly when we are doing um, fluid therapy, one of the things I find very difficult in the clinic is with these types of drip sets, knowing whether you're bolusing, because sometimes when it's full on, they look like they're not, your, the fluids aren't on, and then you have to go up and get out your bifocals and look, <laughs> and then, oh, gosh, it's full on, and oh my goodness, the cat's had you know, a lot of fluid. So that has led to some accidental overdoses in our clinic. So we now have some um, policies in place for that, for cats. So when we do a cat, we, we, if we're going to give fluids at all, we use a Buretrol, and we don't just fill it up, we don't fill it up to the 100. We only now put in one hour's worth of fluids. Or we use a fluid pump, which is a bit of a luxury, and we set it. The other thing that I have done is I've completely cut back on my fluid therapy rate um, to cats under anesthesia. I'm not going over five mils per kilo per hour or sometimes even less. So I think maybe this combination of subclinical heart disease and too many fluids is what's been causing a problem. So it'd be nice to go back and look at the data now that we've adjusted or kind of taken that into account. In dogs, extremes of weight um, contribute to mortality. So if a dog weighs less than five kilos, it is 7.6 times more likely to die than a dog between five and 15 kilos. Um, so there's something about being small that puts you at risk. Um, and the other thing that we found from this uh, SEPSA study, when, when they actually asked the veterinarians, so you weighed the dogs and you wrote down a weight, they, what they actually said was, well, we guessed the weights a lot of the time. And so estimated weight is probably not a thing that we should be doing. We should be doing accurate weighing. But there's something about being a small dog that makes you um, a higher risk candidate for anesthesia. Now cats, the same. What they found in cats was it's, um, you know, and we're pushing to do um, pediatric spays and neuters, and I think it's excellent, and we should get really good at that. But in this study, if you weigh, if you're a cat and you weigh less than two kilos, you are at much higher risk than uh, of anesthetic death compared to a, a cat that weighs between two and six kilos. The opposite, the other end of the spectrum is true too. If you have an obese cat, um, that increases the risk of anesthesia as well. So being less than two kilos or obese is not good if you're a cat. Um, so we do need to kind of think like why that contributes to mortality. So I think with small dogs and cats, what I think might be going on is that we're doing relative drug overdoses because we're not accurately weighing them. Because um, again, like in that SEPSAF study, 20% of the time people just guess the weight. And then I think the other thing about being small is you're going to be at much higher risk for hypothermia. So certainly we should be accurately weighing our very small patients, and we should be using appropriate dilutions of our drugs and diluting down accurately and using um, you know, insulin syringes and doing our dosaging um, very, very accurately in these animals. And then, as I'll talk later, focusing on probably on keeping them warm. The reason that obese animals are at higher risk is that for every gram or so many grams of fat that is in your body, there's an increased cardiac workload. So it puts the heart under a lot more stress, and the heart is already challenged by anesthesia. Fat animals don't breathe as well under anesthesia. Everybody knows that. You put a fat animal on its back, they don't breathe very well. Big issue. Um, altered pharmacokinetics, you know, you're, you're dosing them on based on their body weight. Maybe we should be dosing them on lean body weight. And then the other thing is, there's no doubt, everyone's done these, right? The, the, the fat dog spay, not, an easy, not as easy a procedure a lot more complications. There is some breed susceptibility, and intuitively we probably could have guessed this, but brachycephalic breeds, yes, they're at higher risk, and they're at higher risk because of respiratory obstruction and so on. So we do need to actually take specific care of brachycephalic breeds and their airway when we anesthetize them. The type of procedure um, definitely is important. They used neutering as their reference and then compared other procedures to that. So mostly we are predominantly this group, we're talking about stays and neuters, but we in shelters do a lot of other procedures, you know, amputations, recreations, and so on. Um, dental surgery, um, it, it's a, that surprised me, but that's a much higher risk factor, diagnostic and then minor versus major. So it kind of confirms what we intuitively thought. The duration of the procedure is also very important. 
like I emphasize, small incisions do make a difference, and so does timing and how good you are and how fast you can get your procedure done. So once procedures went over two hours in dogs, the odds ratio of dying went up almost fourfold compared to something that can be completed within an hour. And then when it comes to cats, once you go over 90 minutes, the odds ratio of dying goes up again, just over threefold compared to short 30 minute procedures. So it is important to train your veterinarians to be you know, speedy. But the other thing is, it's not just duration of the surgery is, if once you anesthetize an animal, something should be happening to that animal all the time. If I'm sitting there with an anesthetized animal and I'm waiting for a surgeon, that's not good planning because we're extending our anesthesia time. So we need to plan well. So, you know, I have a tech that tells me if something's not happening, something's wrong. Something should be happening to this animal, not sitting there waiting for someone to do something to it. So we need to plan carefully to keep our anesthetic time down. Preoperative blood work, um, you know, I, I work at a university and the students want to run blood work for everything, including needing to know what the dog's cholesterol is. And I'm like, what's your physical exam tell you? Well, I've got to look at the blood work first. I'm like, no. Good physical exam will tell you a lot. And I'm glad to say that the SEPSAF study showed that that pre -op, running preoperative blood work only decreased the odds in an already sick animal. So despite the fact that it is really nice to do PCV total solids, you know, we have a lot of anemic animals coming into the shelter and so on, it's probably not going to alter the outcome of your clinically based choice of anesthetic protocol. Endotracheal intubation, that came out as something that's really important to discuss because what they found in this study was that if you intubate a cat for a short procedure, it increases the risk of them having uh, anesthetic mortality. If it's a long procedure and in a sicker cat, then intubating them is beneficial, actually decreases the risk of them dying. Now, maybe it's because they also were able to show that respiratory obstruction in recovery happened more commonly in cats and was a cause of acute death in cats. So for short procedures, intubating a cat puts them at higher risk. So we've always been, you know, everyone got to get a tube in, protect the airway and all that stuff. Here's good evidence-based medicine that says that doesn't decrease the risk. It actually increases the risk. Less than 30 minutes, you know, sort of the 30-minute procedure. So most of your cat procedures, hopefully. Um, so why, why, you know, is this an issue? So with cats, we know intubation is much um, harder. They're prone to laryngospasm. If you don't intubate very carefully, you cause trauma. It's a small airway, very likely to swell. You know, you cause bleeding, tracheal irritation. And then we all know if you get overzealous and inflate the cuff, tracheal rupture in cats is um, not, you know, uncommon. We had one in here just last week, um, tracheal rupture after, um, a week after it had a procedure done. So if you are going to intubate cats, and for longer procedures and for sick cats, it's important. But I would say, even if you think you're really good at it, I always do say try and put local anesthetic on the cords to inhibit laryngospasm. Don't try and intubate a cat that's only half anesthetized. That's very, very traumatic, cause a lot of swelling. And when you do go to inflate the cuff, be extremely careful. Only inflate so you don't have a leak when you squeeze the bag and you expand the, um, the lungs. So be very careful about these steps. But what we could actually say is, we need to kind of rethink that. And certainly um, for short procedures, I'm really trying to get people to think you know, better about it. We do a lot of repeat anesthesias for animals, uh, cats going through radiation therapy. And it's been a big mindset change to have our technicians not intubate a cat for a five minute radiation therapy procedure. And they're like telling me, my God, these cats aren't coughing, they're not gag, it's great, you know, um, as long as you're there and watching. So I think perhaps if the procedure is for less than 30 minutes and it's a healthy cat, maybe we shouldn't be intubating them. But yes, if it's long, it's a sick cat, if it's an obese cat, or if it's a brachycephalic cat, then yes, that would be a sensible choice.